is that bar. Uh, that extra gear, that first three steps. Huge strides in the performance. That I might not be the player I am today. All right, welcome to another episode of Behind the Gear. And we have AJ Messi with us. And Mess, London native, you got dual you got dual citizenship working uh, working on both sides of the border. But Mess, you're uh, you're a basically a photographer, uh, videographer, uh, kind of a jack of all trades, hockey background. Um, how's everything going with you, buddy? And then yeah, what's new in uh, in your area of the woods right now? Where are you actually? First of all, where are you right now? I am. I'm in my studio. Um, cool. This is. Uh, I live in Toronto. Um, I uh, live in just by the distillery district in the east end of downtown. Um, I uh, this is my this was originally I moved in here like eight years ago. This was meant to be um, my living quarters slash my photography studio. Um, it quickly became more my living studio because I just accumulated more shit than I ever thought I would. <laughs> and it became like a pain in the ass to move stuff. So this is like an old um old uh linen factory for uh i want to say for the hospitals in toronto so my ceilings are like 15 feet high i got shitty old like kind of like falling apart wood floors but i kind of like made this my own i made the made the chandelier behind me and a lot of the woodwork in here i i, I fancied up myself and it's kind of, kind of just become my home instead of you know i'll do my editing and stuff i've got a little computer uh set up behind me but photo shoots now we have like this whole building has like 87 units and about 30 of them are all photo studios. So, you know, for 150 bucks, I can rent my neighbors and I don't have to move shit. And yeah, they've got, like they've got all the stuff for me. So this is like a film studio, photography studio, you know, there's, well, pre COVID there was, you know, makeup artists, models, you know, you name it, walking through here. Um, now it's just a bunch of people in masks, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Right? <laughs> it's truth yeah. be told, man. I don't know what's going to happen with this, but you know, it kind of feels like things are 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 kind of getting back to normal. But you know, right now it's uh, fucking masks in the hallway. I know it's nuts, man. I totally agree. Now you're you know played hockey, hockey background, you know, living in Canada, living in Ontario. How did you get into film and how did you get into photography and stuff? Was that something you were always kind of passionate about or something you always kind of loved doing? Uh good, really good question. Um, you know, back in the day, I had no idea, man. I just wanted to play hockey. Uh yeah. I thought I thought I was I thought I was like really great. I thought <laughs> we, awesome. all, we all did. We all you did. Know? Well, I was an only child, so my parents also told me I was great. Uh, you know, like all that shit. But I just wanted to play sports. I played basketball. I played football. I played hockey, um, and I did not care at all much about about school, and did not care about you know the only thing I cared about was that John Paul was like how many hat like how many hats the fucking vice principal had taken off me in the school year, um, and and if and if at some point do I get them back? Um, I was I was pretty much a pretty large meathead back then. Um, and then, you know, I wanted to, I always wanted to go to Western, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't really know why, but growing up being a Mustang was always a thing that, that, that I thought was really cool. Um, you know, kind of through 16 through 18 back then we had, you know, OAC, which was grade 13. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and basically all I wanted to do was have, you know, you know, whatever sport I had to play that night and I wanted to have spares in the morning so I could sleep in and go to school late. Um, and, but, you know, get, get to school in time to play or practice whatever sport it was. And, uh, and somehow I got into Western. I really, I think my girlfriend at the time did all my work. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> or, or whatever. Like, I just, I don't even remember. I'm like, yeah, fuck. Thank you. And, uh, and I went to Western my first year at Western. I got a job at the spoke tavern, uh, which was fantastic. Uh, except for I wasn't even 19 yet. So I was 18 working at a bar really thought it was the greatest thing in the world and uh discovered beer on draft because you know when you're underage and you know you're in high school you just buy a six pack or 12 pack and that's it but draft beer holy shit you can sit you know at a table and drink beer so um i ended up in film because i could drink beer and then go to class and <laughs> this, this, it's, the, it's the sad but true like there's the meathead in me um was i was like i was like i can have a couple beers and then go sit in class and watch a movie wow, this is incredible. So Western started a film studies program and I really liked watching film. Like that's, you know, I think we came from the generation of VCR babies that, you know, could go to jumbo video, get a thing of free popcorn and, you know, watch a movie every, you know, every night. And we did that stuff. And then all of a sudden you said, there's, I was like, there's a course. There's a, like, I can actually get a, a like a three-year degree and 
watching movies. Like I feel like I've already got that degree. And then I realized, then I realized after the fact that you had to talk about movies, you had to read textbooks. And I was like, shit, there's more to it than that. But I enjoyed that part because, you know, if you haven't figured out, I can talk with the best of them. So, um, you know, I, I really quickly enjoyed my film studies. It wasn't very practical, but it was, very satisfying it was the most interesting thing i had done thus far let's be real i hadn't hadn't done much that was scholastically based and i loved it i thought it was great i thought it was really creative i started to become a little bit more creative in that element i started to maybe ask a few more questions or observe more instead of just being a total fucking meathead and i would i would be like oh you know i, I remember for one of my independent study projects i went to toronto uh, I drove down to Toronto and I just hung out with people on the street and took photos of them uh, when I was doing my fine arts degree. And I remember just sitting down with this dude for like six hours. He had like, you know, he was having seizures and, and I just sat with him and he made me these, like, he made me these things. <laughs> made me these out of coat, out of, out of like coat hangers. So he made a whole orchestra of a symphony while I sat and talked with him. His name was fucking Moose, actually, which is funny because people sick sometimes... Name. That's a sick name. Yeah, some people sometimes call me Moose, but his name so was wait, really... So for people who can't see, basically like little figures, like little... Yeah, those yeah, are it's like uh, coat hangers. It's, and, it's, and if you ever you tried can... to bend a, a coat hanger, it's not easy. No, but not at bend all. it into something. So he literally made me, you know, a whole orchestra of dudes playing different instruments. Okay, that's cool. And I turned it into like a project, an art project for photography. And that's kind of what... At the same time I was doing film, I realized that there was things out there that were far beyond me and far beyond like my understand my limited, you know, London, Ontario, uh, I guess growing up in London, you know, you're pretty sheltered and we were all very, very fortunate. But uh, that kind of started propelling me into, into, you know, like just wondering what else was out there and desire to leave the uh, 519 area code and see what, what else there is. So, when I graduated from Western with a film degree in 2000, in 1999, actually, um, I then immediately packed up my truck and moved to Vancouver to work in film because that was kind of like known as Hollywood North at yeah, the time. Right. Yeah. And that, at that time, you know, there was Dark Angel, uh, which was Jessica Alba's coming out story. And then there was the end of X-Files that was going on out there. And then there was other productions going on. And I just knew that maybe that would be, that would be where I should be. And I left... I left London on a Wednesday. I think it was like October 31st or October 30th because I remember it was around Halloween and drove straight across the country, right across into Vancouver. Uh, it took like 53 hours pulling into White Rock. And then, so I think we went through the States if I remember correctly, because we wanted to get there fast and we, we didn't have anything illegal. So we didn't care about going across the border <laughs> um, because uh, yeah, that's something you got to worry about. And pulled into, pulled into Vancouver, and literally went to a party on a boat in the Plaza of Nations, met some skateboard dude that was named Gord. And he get, gave me my first job that day, literally starting Monday in Burnaby on a TV show. So I wasn't even in, and I was shit faced. I was wasted, having a great time. And I get a job like out of nowhere in my dream scenario. It wasn't a dream scenario. It was a set deck, but it was on a movie set. And that kind of allowed me to like explore and understand you know, watch movie making. And this was a bad, bad show. It was called Most Luchadors. And they were wrestlers by day and superheroes by night. Oh, and it was a Fox, Fox Kids show. But this was like, not, this is 2000, right? Oh, no, so this is falling off like WWE and yeah, WWF. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. They're doing green screen with the wrestlers. So in our studio, we had a wrestling ring and then a green screen with like fans. It was insane for 2000. But it was so poorly done that it looked like when I watched the first episode, I was really excited thinking, and I was like, oh, mom, you know, my parents are in the States. They can watch it. And I start, I watched it and I'm like, you know what? Scratch that, mom. Just, you know, go grocery shopping, do whatever you do. Do not watch my show. <laughs> and, but ever since then, it's been my, it's kind of been my love. And, um, you know, in, in, in various ways, I've always come back to this. In 2011, I drove across the country with a guy named Barry Murphy with, with a mutual friend, Eric Varden kind of put us together, but we documented because I was an NHL photographer at the time. And by NHL, I mean, like they would hire me for special events, winter classics, uh, Stanley cups, all-star games. But because 2011, there was a lockout. 
I drove across the country. I went, flew to uh, Halifax, rented a car, and drove all the way to um, all the way to Vancouver, wow. interviewing people along the way about their perspective on the lockout. One of the really like one of the most adventurous and daring things that I've ever done because I paid for it, which was not a great thing because I didn't have a lot of money. But it was also like we were time sensitive because by the time we got to Vancouver, the lockout was almost over <laughs> and it was like irrelevant. You're like, this sucks. Like, could you just make it a little bit? Stop talking. Yeah. And we ended up going to my house in Fort, Fort Mac where I grew up uh, just for like nostalgic reasons. And we just we went to each arena outside of every major city and just asked them their perspective and said, you know, who whose side are you on? And at that time, most of them were on the uh because there were, it was a lockout, but obviously on the fan on the player side, yeah. it was really good. It could have been awesome, but I had no idea what the fuck I was doing. No plan, no nothing. Like literally, again, kind of like this. My my, it was as fast as my Vancouver drive. Like yeah. on Wednesday, I met Barry Murphy, and on Friday, we were renting a car in Halifax to do this half brain fucking story that never saw the light of day. And I think ever since then, I've, I've just always knew that I've come back to making some sort of movie. Otherwise I'd feel like I never fucking accomplished one of my goals. Yeah. Well, and like you kind of uh, brushed over it. Obviously you're an adventurous guy and you don't mind taking risks every once in a while and trying new stuff, which is really, really cool. Um, what, what was it like shooting for the NHL, like going to winter classics and doing some of these special events? Like, did you get to meet some of the players or were you just kind of, you know, taking pictures? Like what was that whole environment? Like, was it pretty cool to kind of be behind the scenes there? It was pretty cool, man. Yeah. yeah. It was amazing. Uh, it was, it was, I like mean, being a hockey guy, you must have got starstruck a little bit by some of the guys, like seeing some of these players. No, because I think I'm fucking more of a star than they are. That's the ego in me uh, at times. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's, and that's like a little tongue in cheek, but anyone yeah, who knows yeah. me probably, probably would agree in some ways. But no, dude, being London, being from London, man, we got them in our, we got them like sitting at the fucking bar with us. Like, yeah, that's true. You, yep. know, yep. you know, back in the day, we'd be hanging out, having beers with Brian Campbell and um, uh, with Soupy and shit like that. Like those guys were all in our lives and Ruchin yeah. was always around us at times too. So that's London kind of like push that away but i mean there's some pretty cool stories in my life one of my best ones was and this is when i was starstruck but i was like 10 years old we lived in fort mac my parents and i would we, we would always go um to Banff for um march break and back in the day there used to be a week off in between the end of the season and the beginning of the playoffs and obviously there was less travel and less games and i think probably back then 85 80 84 85 it might've been a five game first round series. So they probably had, no, that's right. how they probably got away with it. Yeah. But, you know, long story short, I get into an elevator, you know, at the Banff hotel or like, not even like the Banff Springs. Like it was like, just like some run of the mill hotel. And I was an, obviously an Oilers fan. My last name being Messier, especially growing up in Fort Mac, you know, people would just be like, are you, are you related to Mark? So, you know, and we're not related to Mark. I've tried to harass him to say yes we are related and <laughs> it hasn't it hasn't worked at all but um you know i'm in the elevator and i go to press the button and it was like one of those like i don't know maybe there's like a coke commercial or something where you know the hand reaches into the elevator yeah, yeah, and totally stops it and all of a sudden it stops it and it's paul coffee and paul coffee gets into the elevator with me and tells me to hit like four or something like that and i'm like i hit four and i'm just like probably drooling i'm like nine or ten years old and I haven't fucking figured out what's going on. Um, I, I'm just like, it's Paul Coffee in the elevator, go up to my room. And then we hop in the car and my parents are like, we're going to go get something to eat. And we go to an arena in Banff. And I'm like, what, like, why it's, well, I didn't bring my hockey equipment. Why the hell are we here? And then I'm in the, in the, in the parking lot. I just see people with Oilers jerseys on still. I'm, te I'm not smart. I'm like a little me dad. And, uh, and I still haven't fucking figured out a thing what's going on. And I walk, we walk into the uh, arena and Sure and behold, there's the Oilers practicing and they've been they're they're doing their one week of you know team bonding prior to going into the playoffs. And I see Kenny Lindsman and Kevin McClellan like duking it out at center ice, like we're in, and I'm just like I'm shattered because I'm like, why are they fighting? And then I'm like enthralled because I'm like, oh my God, there's Brad Fuhr, like there's Andy Moog, like nice. you know, there's these are my these are my players, these are my guys. So you know, that was my starstruck moment. And then it was like getting all their autographs, and they were all so cool. And then my favorite player back then was kind of Glenn Anderson. Um, and, I, you know, I got his autograph, Messier. I got Messier's autograph. And then it was so light that I fucking decided to write over it so that I could see it. <laughs> totally, 
totally the again little meathead in me uh ruined the whole autograph that i got and that was kind of my starstruck moment and then when i went to shoot for the for the nhl i kind of already had that out of me you know like yeah. like i said we had drank with so and so and done this with so and so or had dinner with so and so and then i'd met them so when i met them first of all there's rules cuz you're shooting for getty there's no like you know kind of face to face and there's no you know like you're there for a job yeah. which at times i i think if you asked any of them i did a very poor job of um but like i remember i remember in 2007 i went up to messier I had, you know, my, my, um, lanyard that said, you know, on my name's Andre Messi. So I think it said Andre, it might've said AJ. Anyways, I went up to Mark to talk to him and he just signed, he signed right over my face <laughs> and right over Messier and didn't even let me get a word out. And I remember Bruce Bennett, who's like a legendary photographer in out of New York, he's sitting over there just shaking. He said, first of all, not happy that i went to confront mark messier but second of all just by like you're such a loser like he just put you in your place <laughs> so that was kind of that was kind of like the oh yeah i'm still a nobody kind of thing like yeah you are but uh but i would say that what i was more starstruck was like shooting at fenway was like the greatest thing i've ever done like by far it was the coolest thing because i'm also a baseball fan and a sports fan like fenway being able to walk into the green monster and then walk out of the green monster in that little like opening onto the field where they've got an ice rink and do whatever you want out there. Like, I mean, within, you know, a certain level of professionalism, I wasn't doing snow angels, but I was taking photos and shit. It was, it was really great. That's cool. And that's what I kind of did for them more. I wasn't really a game shooter. So my, one of my best friends, Dave Sanford is a London guy. He's the one that kind of introduced me and introduced my photography to the NHL. The NHL just let me kind of wander and do stuff and be creative. And that's what I think is one of my, my strong suits. When you try and pigeonhole me, I really, I suck and I'm not as good. And there's other people that are much better at it than me. So that for me was my starstruck was like, you know, shooting there. I mean, we obviously shot at Rich Stadium. That wasn't as big of a wild thing. Heinz Field, that Winter Classic was pretty incredible. I got to go way up into the top of the scoreboard and shoot as they did the fireworks as the game started. And I was like, you know, 30 stories up in the air. Maybe it was 10. I might, I exaggerate once in a while too. But it, those were the, those are the really interesting and fun parts that I'll always remember. And I enjoy looking back at my photos of them. It's, it was, it was awesome. Like, again, those were the, those are the times where you're like, this is what I'm meant to do. You know, like, yeah. this is the fun part. No, totally, man. I, I talk about this a lot with, with, with guys in a bunch of different professions and you sound like you have a really cool profession with a lot of different things. You're not doing the same thing every day, which is cool. Um, but even in hockey you guys are like, Oh, it was great, man. You get to do hockey every day. I'm like, yeah, it's awesome. I love it. But there's days it sucks, man. And for you, I'm assuming it's the same thing. Guys and girls look at you like these these photos are unbelievable. These these videos are great. Man, you must love what you do. Like, there's got to be days that, that that are tough. So, what what are some things that are like a bit of a drag for you in your profession? As far as you know, you get you go from Fenway Park to maybe shooting a couple of wedding photos. Like, I, I don't I don't know the difference, right? But like, you know, what is is there anything that you're just like, no, I'm not doing that. No, that's not. Well, to be honest with you, like, it's still a job, right? Yeah. And it's still like. You know, it's still, you still got to figure that stuff out. I mean, this last year and a half has been really tough for me on my for career because sure. there, there's been nothing, you know, mm -hmm. and that's probably been my first hiccup. When I moved to Toronto in 2007, you know, I just hustled and, and tried to do as much as I can. And I would do stuff for free. I started shooting for the ROM. Um, I, you know, I've, I've really found some really high end, awesome clients here. And it's been, it's been quite amazing. And then four years ago, I took off to start this movie which means I left my career and, you know, basically was like, I'm going to put it on hold and do this. And every so often I would have my clients say, are you in town? Can you do this? And if it wasn't worth my time, I'd be like, I'm so sorry. And I may have lost some clients along the way, but you know, I can't come back to the city for a $500 job. If it's going to cost me 500 bucks in a flight yeah. and two or three days of stuff to do. And I had largely rented this place out. To, through various means. I used Airbnb. I had friends move in, so I didn't have a place to stay. So, you know, coming back and doing, and doing, you know, trying to get our lives back to normal and then COVID hits this last year, I realized my job is really not essential. Like, you know, and, and you put, put your a level of perspective going that it shouldn't be, it should it really shouldn't be essential. And there's much more important 
things out there. But that was probably the hardest part was being like, because I remember watching my dad go through tough times, you know, with his industry. My mom was always the steady rock in our family and always had a job that was was constant. But my dad was a renovator. He, he used to sell high, uh, cars at Highbury Ford. Like he would go and he would have to hustle and try and find jobs. And I always said that I didn't want to have to do that. And then I've been doing that off and on for like a year and a half now. Yeah. And it was really just like, oh, you're not so fucking hot shit there, AJ. Like, you know, you're just, you are, you are your father's son in a, in a, in a proud and also hum, humbling way. Yeah. So, you know, I enjoy, if I have my camera, I'm happy, man. Like I, 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 you know, I thought that I would never like weddings and then I did weddings and then I was like, you know what? And you get paid very well for doing them. And, the, yeah. and it's, it's, it's a little bit of lead up, you know, like it's a lot of back and forth. Uh, and then it's the wedding. And then it's like a couple of days of editing and it's over and you've got a fairly good check for what you had to do. You yeah. know, the only element of doing a wedding is, is that I'm a dude and I'm 100% a guy's guy. And I feel like, you know, I, I, I should have had back in the day, I should have had a female on my team or a partner because they would bring uh, an, like a sensuality to it or, or, a, or a, an aesthetic that I don't see, you know, um, I'm looking at it going like, you know, I want to have a cigar and a beer kind of perspective when, you know, someone's like, Oh my God, those shoes are adorable. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's not, you know, that's not, that's not me. But so I would get hired by my friends or friends or friends. And sometimes my buddies would try and get me to shoot their wedding. And then their wives or future wives would be like, that's AJ. He's not shooting our fucking wedding. Um, <laughs> and, and, and that was the truth, right? They're just like, they know me very well. And they're like, you know, but most of them I got to shoot. Like I shot Varden's wedding in Corsica. And uh, so those, those, oh. those were not, those were not miserable things. And ah. um, so, yeah, no, it's, 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 I've, I've been, I've been blessed to do a lot and I've been blessed to do a lot of different things, but you know, this last year and a half of not having any work uh, was probably the toughest part of my career. And you know what, man, this, this last year, I think for a lot of industries, and you said it perfectly, like it puts a lot of things in, in, into perspective, you know what I mean? Even hockey, like we all love hockey. Kids want to play hockey. Parents want their kids to make the NHL. We get it, but it's not an essential service. It's not like the priority, right? Family, friends, health, all that stuff is, yeah. is such a, is so, so much more important, you know? And I think that's something that, you know, if anything, this pandemic's taught me as well. The kicker is it's hard to like have a family and, and, and raise people when you can't make any money. So you, you got to figure out how to make, uh, how to make ends meet and how to, you know, kind of keep pushing the, pushing the wheel forward. You know, it's, it's again, that's why I was kind of like intrigued by what you're doing last summer. And I, and I tried to reach out to you and that's why I was doing it with Damien. I was trying to stay creative and still try and figure out a way of like, how can I monitor? Of course, I was always trying to figure out how to monetize this, but half the shit that I do, I know I can't because it's either too niche and that's something that we're struggling with, with our film is, you know, you really have to do mainstream stuff. And, uh, and I've never really cared about that. And, yeah. and now that I'm getting older, I'm starting to realize that, you know, maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't be so niche because, you know, you do need to pay for shit. Like you can't just, just not, you know, just throw it on your credit card and not worry about it or stuff. But, you know, and that's the thing, but I was trying to do stuff that was creative, that I was enjoying, um, that made me feel like I was being productive and still, and still being happy, you know, and, yeah, and, I, and I, I realized that late in my life. Well, I mean, not late in my life, but you know, by the time I got to college and started to do photography and film that I really am a creative person. I didn't do any of that shit in high school, man. I was just like, what do you guys want to do? You want to get stoned? You want to, what do you want to do? You want to go get drunk? Do you want to watch a movie? Like what sport can we play? Where can we play it? That was my life. And, and then I evolved. I mean, I still, sport is still a huge part of my life. Um, but there's a lot more other things, you know, I, I, I've just, I've appreciated it so much more. So, you know, continuing to do that. I mean, so during, during COVID we were editing our movie, um, and that was also productive and good. And it probably wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for COVID. Like yeah. we would have probably still been working and doing other stuff and the movie might still be being edited. So some good things did come of it. The problem was, is I wasn't doing the editing. My partner was, so it was all on him to do it. Originally, we were going to do it together, but we couldn't be in the same room. We couldn't be in the same space. Um, and that was the hard part was we were going to work on editing because basically, man, you shoot, a, you shoot a movie and then you edit a movie. It's 50-50. Like you could shoot right. something and then edit a different movie than you shot and vice versa. Like you thought you were going to do something. And all of a sudden, something else became more important and your movie just changed. Well, you know, when one guy's doing it, the other guy's not. Steve would just send me clips here and there and say, what do you think of this? What do you think of this edit? What do you think of this? 
and I would have five minutes of, of movie time. And then I would have to be like, cool, good luck. Send me more. And, and that was, that was the way that we worked. Um, so, you know, yeah, it is, it is important to always try and continue to move forward. And, and, and I think, I think at times last year, I, I was like stuck. I was just like, I was felt like I was in quicksand sinking. Oh, uh, sure. But, but I feel like now, except for the fact that it's getting so damn dark in here, I feel it is actually getting brighter <laughs> in, this, in, this, in this world. I'm sorry. Like, it looks like it's a hailstorm outside. So oh, um, maybe, yeah. is this okay? Oh yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Man. yeah. 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 So, you know, that was it. It's, it's, it's like now it seems like I'm getting emails again for work and, you know, and things are coming around and, and that's obviously, uh, you know, if the non-essentials are starting to get uh, work, that's great. Cause yeah. you know, I'm not the only one. No, totally. I want to get into your moving in a sec, but one thing you said, I want to hit on about kind of being niche and, and being creative. I think if one thing I've gotten more into because I have more time in my hands is like finding different little communities, like finding, you know, on Reddit or Facebook or whatever it is, but these little communities that I think a lot more people appreciate genuine stuff. And like the stuff that you're doing is very genuine. It's it's stuff that you love doing and you're passionate about it. So I I, I know what you're saying. It's not, maybe not going to be a blockbuster. Maybe you're not going to be, you know, something that, that millions and millions of people are going to want to look at, but I think, you know, being authentic to who you are and being creative, I think people really appreciate that. And that's the one thing that I love about even like just chatting with you, getting to know you and different people like that, that you're, you're just authentic, like the way you're talking, the way you like you tell stories. I love it. It's, you know, like it's, it's great. So I think staying true to that is huge and getting into your movie. Like you guys spent a lot of time on this and, you know, this kind of like a bit of a baby here. You guys are going through the whole process of obviously filming it, getting no people, you know, traveling, doing all this stuff. And this is self-funded as well. Correct. It's uh, it has been, it's been a, it's been a one hell of a road trip. Uh, yeah. Right. We started in 20 late 20. Well, late 2016, early 2017 started this movie um, or started this, the kind of the, the, the brainchild and, and the concept of it uh, here, right here at this table where I'm sitting right now yeah. in Feb, Feb, February 8th, myself, uh, my partner on the film, Steve, uh, Stephen Hoffner, and then one of my best friends, uh, Simon Ibel. And we all, Steve had this idea. So Steve worked for NHL.com. Um, he was actually, uh, he had done a bunch of things within the NHL, but I met him through the NHL through, um, we've known each other probably since 2010 when we met each other at the Heritage Classic, which was out in Calgary. I think that was the first one, or maybe it was the second one, if the first one was, I think, Edmonton, um, Montreal. But whatever, it was in Calgary. We met each other. We were both Toronto-based. And uh, and Steve is a film guy from U of T. I'm a film guy from Western, but Steve actually took filmmaking, which is, you know, much different than let's smoke a joint and watch a movie and talk of theoretical, um, <laughs> right. <laughs> which, you know, was, was something that, that I think, you know, Western Western was awesome for, we had wonderful props and it was great. And it really spurned my, my interest in, in filmmaking, but um, you know, the fact of like how to make a film and to talk about theoretical, like I'm not going to be a film critic because I can't, I can't even write. So that's not going to work. Um, but I can, I can make shit or I can do shit. I'm a, I'd like to think that I'm a doer. Uh, so, you know, the fact that um, I had no idea how to make this movie, like yeah. fuck it from start to finish, but I had Steve as a partner who, who he didn't know how to make it either, but he knew more than me. And he knew, I, he knew what things had to be done. And he's incredibly professional in relation to me. Like you can see me, I'm fucking sweating. Cause I had to turn my AC off. Like <laughs> This would not be, this would not be okay for Steve. Steve's like, dude, you're, you're a fucking mess. Go change or, you know, yeah. Like, but, but like, and that's the thing is we, we balance each other out really, really well. Sure, you yeah. know? When, when shit, when shit hit the fan and things didn't come up, like I would pick us both up. I'd like to think we did. Um, but I think he also picked me up in some ways too. Like when there had to be a contract sign within two minutes, like I, I would be lost. And Steve was like, here's the contract, sign it. Let's send it off. So 2016, 17, we're talking about this. Steve had an idea of doing, doing a show on hockey played all over the world. And one of those play, and they're like unique places, right? Like you've heard of the one that was obviously that Tim Horton story um, that was in Kenya. Yes. Um, that Tim Hortons did a, did a, did a three minute short with, I think it was McKinnon and Crosby. Um, that was one of his, that was one of his early babies that one episode would have been, let's focus on the Kenyan lions team. The other one of the other episodes was this Fort DuPont Cannons team out of Washington, D.C. And 
the what we decided to do was Steve and I were talking and we were like, well, dude, we can't fly to Kenya. Like what what can we do that is feasible? And like a little bit by default, or maybe it was fate, we were like, let's go to DC. Like we can drive, we can fly. DC is not far. Like, you know, we don't need to spend a lot of money and we could try and get this concept down and 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 figure it out. So that was really the instigation for for how how we came about it. like and and as i told you off camera we really sadly or beautifully misread the, the entire the entire program from start to finish uh we didn't understand we didn't understand american hockey we didn't understand community hockey we didn't understand after school programs we didn't understand what it's like to live in uh you know a low income you know low income american neighborhood community like we fucking knew nothing, man, except for like shit that we had watched in movies, which really doesn't educate you to the to how to deal with that stuff. In August of 2017, um, this team has a summer camp. So first of all, the Fort DuPont Cannons was started by a man named Neil Henderson in 1976 in the driveway of his house in Maryland, uh, in in a small town about 20 minutes outside of DC and in, in, in Maryland. His son said, I want to play hockey. Now, Coach Neal, we call him Coach Neal affectionately, um, he played semi-pro hockey for much of his life. He, you know, his his one claim to fame was kind of like the Moonlight Graham moment in um, Field of Dreams. When he was 40, I'm going to say 41, the Capitals moved to Washington. They sent him an invite to try out for the Capitals. Wow. And at 41, he was working for the government and he was married with a kid. And he was like, my hockey days are done. Like, I don't care. But he always dreamt of playing hockey, like professional hockey. And like I said, he, he traveled all around, played semi-pro all over the East coast, played in Utah, like, but the man's 83 years old. The dude was doing this before, like he's basically the same age as Willie, but wow. Willie was doing it in Canada. Right. Like, yeah. like he was doing it in, in like in the States and in Utah and shit, which is really, really admirable in itself. And he's got some great stories. Like he was telling us stories where, you know, if there was a black guy on a hockey team, he had to go somewhere else. Like they were just traveling salesmen, right? And unfortunately, there was teams were only allowed to have one black player on the team. So if if a young black player came up and wanted to play, it was basically the two of them trying out against each other. And, you know, he tells a great story of, you know, this young buck comes into the team. They decide to let him go because he's the older, the older player or or not as good or just the other black guy that you can't have two on. And he goes to a team across the river and they come into their barn and kick the shit out of him. And coach Neil takes, takes, takes like every single guy out of the blue line. He was apparently a ruthless hip check defenseman yeah. and just slaughtered them. And he, and he just giggles to himself as he smokes his pipe and he tells me a story <laughs> and I just love it. Like we've got 79 pages of beauties of just fucking coach Neil. If you ever want coach Neil on here, brother, it would be, I could help you set that up. Oh, that would be would amazing. Love, yeah. You would love it, man. Yeah. So, so anyways, he started this program up for his son. His son basically just grabbed his buddies and any relatives, and they started playing out of the Fort DuPont arena back then. None of them had money to play. None of them, they figured out how to just, you know, pay for ice time. And they basically got donations to put clothes together or they, you know, and every year coach literally sews all the equipment by hand. So he collects all the equipment from the program because it's technically coach Neal's equipment. And, he sews it, sews their jerseys. You know, they save up to get jerseys. When a new player comes to the team, they save up to get a new new jersey for this player. Although the jerseys never leave the Fort DuPont Arena. The, it's not physically ever yours, right. but you will get a new jersey when you when you make that senior team. And that's just what they've done for since since 76. So like 44, 45 years. And Coach Neal, although with COVID and with his health, isn't necessarily as as uh, hands-on as you'd like to be um, up till when we stopped finishing filming, which was um, December of 2019. So in December, 2019, coach Neil was, uh, was inducted into the USA hockey hall of fame. First black man put in the USA hall of fame and also a fucking fantastic ending for a movie that we did not have an ending for. So that was great. Uh, <laughs> and, and he, but he wasn't on the bench as much. Um, he likes to video. He likes to, uh, he likes to video record all the games and because of his wife's health here and there, he wasn't always at practice. And because of COVID now, 
We're not sure. I mean, they haven't played in a year and a half. The Fort DuPont arena is still not open uh, for anybody. Um, so, you know, we're hoping, we were always hoping that we could help this program out. They're always like, you know, they're not, they actually don't, they never needed our help. They never asked for our help. We always questioned whether two white dudes should be telling a story about a black hockey team, you know, even though they're not a black hockey team, they're a minority based hockey team, but they've got a couple, um, kids of Asian descent. They've got a couple kids of Spanish descent. There's a couple white kids on there. Like his whole policy is he does not turn anybody down. If you want to play hockey, then you can play hockey. And whether if you have, a, if you have a disability, if you have anything, um, you know, or sorry, nothing, you know, and it doesn't cost you anything. They've got money. Like I said, the capitals, the NHL pitches in, they get a lot of press, um, which then in turn brings donations in. It's the fact that, you know, they just don't have, you know, it's, it's tough because they don't, they don't get a lot of games because they're not in the league. They have 43 practices a year. They don't like to use those practice times for a game because like i said before they have 85 kids on the ice they have a sports they have a junior and they have a senior team and you know if they those 43 practices are for those 85 kids if you make it a game those 85 kids don't get one practice now maybe 20 kids get a practice because they've got a game but those 60 kids lose one practice and that's more important to coach than a game which is amazingly beautiful and so foreign to me because i'd be like when the hell are we playing a game coach? Like, why am I practicing? Yeah. And they don't care. They're just like, you learn more in a practice. You learn bad habits in a game. These kids are grown up on it. Like that was the whole process of us going through and learning about this program. It's not about the games. It's not about wins and losses. It's about, it's about being somewhere where you're part of a family and part of a community. Um, and you're being, and you're somewhere safe and out of trouble. I mean, that's one of those things that they tried to inst install in the area early on was that you knew that you were safe inside the Fort DuPont arena because you had five men, uh, largely men. I shouldn't say that. Miss Dean uh, is an 82 year old manager who's been managing with coach for 40 years. So you've got, you know, and you've got parents in there and they're all watching after your kids. So for those two hours, they're safe. They're not, nothing's going to go wrong with them. Whereas they step out of the arena in a, in a you know, in the eighties, that area was very dangerous. You know, they would have a cop stand outside the rink. They would have, you know, I was told a story where the, you know, literally like in Friday in the movie, like the ice cream man would be selling drugs next to, you know, with, with, with popsicles. Uh, okay. And he was sitting in the parking lot. So that was like their reality that is so foreign to Steve and I, that we were like, can we even tell this story with like, and do it justice? So, you know, that's how we stumbled upon it was we went down, saw these kids running in a parking lot like August of 2017 and like 85, 95 degree humid DC weather sweating there. Like I'm sweating and I turned my AC off. These guys were like doing calisthenics and doing suicides and doing all this shit, not a hockey stick in sight, like just a hockey Jersey on. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, man, these kids are, these kids are hardcore. And then in the afternoon they would go on the ice and that's when I got to see them on the ice and see how they interacted. And again, it was very different for me to understand because it looked like chaos on skates. Like it looked just like I had no idea what was going on and it looked like some of them didn't know either, but there's, there's, there's a level of organization, you know, obviously any squirts, no matter what skill level they are, they're still squirts and they're kids and they're going to be doing crazy shit. There's lots of yelling going on, but they all seem to make it work. And really it was, it was quite simple. You know, at the end of that week, we were there for five days on the fifth day. We spent it with coach Neil. It was a Saturday myself. Um, my other, my cousin, I brought my cousin in, my cousin's an actor in Atlanta and I brought him in as a, as a, someone within the industry. Unfortunately, he's another white dude. Um, but like, so there's three white dudes just making a black movie, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, and yes, that did become problematic, but I brought him in as kind of like someone within the industry and he's got a bit of cachet. Like four years ago, he wasn't, you know, he was just an actor, a bit actor. And now he's like a bit bigger of a bit actor. Like, you know, he's in, he's been in Ozark and, and I was hoping that maybe his name would add a little bit of, a little bit of help to us trying to sell this down the road. And he's smart and he's, and he was, and he had a good energy and he likes to do good shit. So I brought him in. And so the three of us go to spend the day with coach Neil and, and his wife, Bernice. And we end up sitting in the, in this, in the kitchen. And that's the day of the Charlottesville protest. And then the riot and the murder and Charlottesville was, you know, 45 minutes outside of DC. And we had talked about, should we go to this, you know, this protest? Cause they were taken down 
the I think it was the Robert E. Lee statue, and there was going to be a you know a white supremacist versus you know I guess human rights kind of march, and we thought should we see this? Like we're two Canadian dudes, should we go and try to start? And I mean, thankfully we didn't go because shit hit the fan. And I think it was more important to be sitting with Coach Neil and Bernice as we're watching this on CNN unfold. And I think Steve and I looked at each other and said, this is our fucking movie. Like, you know, this is, this is America. Like this is, this is, this is it. You know, maybe it shouldn't be being told by two Canadians, but I don't see anybody else in this fucking room. So let's just tell the story. And that's what we did. And that's what we've done ever since. I mean, we've put all our money into it. We put all our energy into it. Um, We've applied for grants. We've gotten denied by most of them. We did get a $10,000 grant from Rogovi Foundation, which was really kind of the moment halfway through the movie that we were going to quit because we were done spending our money. And that kind of just rejuvenated us. And I think I was like, well, I got more room on my credit card. So I was like, fuck it, let's (laughs) do it. And, And that was kind of it. It propelled us to the second half of our movie. And things happen within our story that made it more interesting. And of course, like we have already spent four months with these people. And, yeah. you know, what do you do with all those, that relationship and these promises? It became a huge, you know, and it still is a huge burden that we have, we are the, you know, we're the gatekeepers to Coach Neil's legacy right now, right? I mean, Coach Neil's still alive and, and doing great. And we still talk to him on a monthly or weekly basis. Um, but like, he may never get it back on the ice again because of, you know, regulations or health wise. Um, and we've promised to him and his family and to the coaches that we would be respectful and we would, we would, we would do our best to tell coach Neil's story in a, in a, in a, in the proper light. It's a positive light. There's no way you can make this man not look like a, like, a, you know, a, a saint or an angel. Um, and he does that on his own. Um, but we've got, we, we, we promised these guys that, you know, when we started it, that we were going to finish it. So, you know, that's kind of where we were. We were like, you know, we did it for like 16 months. And then we finished like one, two months before COVID, like, well, actually a month and a half before COVID. And, and then we've just been editing and we've, we've applied to film festivals. Uh, I made these lovely hats to kind of build up a little bit of, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, like, just like, uh, you know, you have all these people asking you, how's your movie coming along or how's it going? Like, and it was like, my buddies are like, but you gave me this really great hat. Like, that's the funny part. He's like, how's the movie? I'm like, dude. I gave you a hat, didn't I? Like, why are you asking me about this fucking thing? Like for the 15th time, like just shut the fuck up and wear the hat. Yeah. And that was, that was, that's kind of where we were, where I've been the last like six months. Like just the movie will be somewhere. I just don't know. Stop asking me. And, and that's it. We're just trying to sell it now. As I mentioned to you in an email, we're, you know, we've been working really tightly. The NHL and Kim Davis has been, has been incredibly helpful for us along the way, even just in like, making the right connections or if someone wasn't getting back to us, Kim would send a nice email saying, you know, uh, AJ and Steve are still waiting for a response. And then all of a sudden we get an email five seconds later. And if you don't know who Kim is, um, Kim's probably one of the most influential humans in in hockey. Um, She's also obviously a, a, a woman and a black woman for that matter. And was like, you know, one of, I think she was on Oprah's top 100 uh, most influential women in entertainment or in sports i'm not sure um but she's an amazing woman and she's been backing us like all the way she loves us I, I think she does or maybe she thinks we're a nuisance and she just wants to get us <laughs> off her back but anytime we ask for anything she's been there so we've been working with her and with rob woolley of the nhl um to um try when the theaters come back in the fall is to have a premiere in dc with the fort dupont cannons hockey program now granted it's been two years some things have changed some players have 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 filtered out, um, but they'll come back. And 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 I mean, our kids that we follow in the movie, um, Rob and Ravon are now, I want to say they're 20. You know, we filmed them for their senior year and they were 18 then. So I haven't seen them. We haven't seen them in two years. I mean, they could have, they could have a family, they could have jobs. I mean, we reach out to them, but they're not as good as getting back to us because they are young and they've got a life and they think we're old, you know, old white dudes, you know, that are just like just annoying being like, are you, like, I remember we were trying to get them filming and they're just like, when are you going to leave us alone? Like, when can we have our lives back? Uh, but, uh, but yeah, you know, hopefully in the fall we'll have a show. Um, and like, hopefully it goes, you know, we can go to a full theater or at least a, a 50% theater, 50% capacity. And, 
and we can show them our movie, whether it ends up on your TV screen, on streaming, or in the theaters around you, we have no control over that. Um, and that's one of the things that we've really been struggling with because America doesn't care about hockey, uh, unfortunately. At least, at least the people that make decisions to see what's on your TV don't give a shit about hockey. Um, and we found that out the hard way. Uh, and it's been really frustrating, um, very frustrating. So, you know, they're like, no one's going to watch it. And you're like, really? But someone's going to watch a chess movie. Someone's going to watch a movie about chess, but yeah. no one wants to watch a hockey movie. Like, give me a break. So, you know, like what? We really needed another Redux version of Mighty Ducks, but this is not fucking hey. important. Hey. Well, I think too, like, I mean, you're hitting on another topic that is a big, big topic right now, right? Is that the whole, the whole inclusion and hockey is for everyone. And that's something that the NHL is really trying to push. And even, even the backstory of just where this whole program, where the Porty Point program started and, you know, and where it's come and the one gentleman that started is still there, you know, still part of it. Right. Which is huge. And then kind of almost a legacy, obviously thing that now there's other young guys, I'm sure that are helping coaching and they're getting involved with it. And the other thing that I'd like that I love of what you said is they're inclusive. They have Asians, they have whites, they have, you know, I know pr probably predominantly black, but they're inclusive. Right. So it kind of, it's, it's, which is awesome. And I think that's like telling stories like this, whether it's hockey, basketball, baseball, whatever, it doesn't matter. I think it's more about that whole underlying story of what this thing actually really is. And just being able to have, be an outlet, like a boys and girls club or a hockey program that just kids can go to. And like you said, be safe for that hour, two hours, three hours, four hours a week and have people that genuinely care about them, which I think is huge, you know? And so I, I'm excited, man. Now, is there, is there trailers or anything like that where people can go check it out or you guys have a website where we can buy the hats or anything like that? Come on, you got to help me out here. Damn, you're, you're asking two things that I cannot help you with. Well, so, you know, I think it was like maybe a year ago, I came up with this idea. We made some shirts too that said, our, our, our catchphrase for our movie is hockey has no color, um, which uh, I think I think coach said that a few times in our movie where he says, you know, the puck doesn't care what color your skin is, you know. Uh, oh. And it was just like, he just says, he has coachisms that are wonderful. So, you know, some are, some are kind of, you know, some are dated and some are like, sort, sort of like, oh, you have to roll your eyes at. But <laughs> most of them are, most of them are fucking perfect. Like yeah. his delivery, his delivery is great. I um, mean, he's such a classy, classy dude. Um, I don't think he'll listen to this because he does not like swearing. So if he hears me swearing, he'll just, <laughs> he'll just, he'll just turn it off. I think I said shit once and he was like, Hey Jay, you do not swear in front of a lady. And, and cause Miss Dean was in the room and I was like, Oh, you know, like, I think I said, Oh fuck. And then I'm like, Oh no, no. Like, <laughs> like, so, um, but, uh, I came up with the hat idea and then we came up with t-shirts and we did it. We did it. And people love them. Like they're, they're pretty rad, man. Like oh, they, cool. they, the, the, the design came pretty cool. Um, I just, I, I just searched around. I had hockey sticks coming out of it too, out of the, out of the cannons. And then I was like, that looks too hockey. Like hockey sometimes goes overboard to yeah. say that this is hockey. And then we also wanted to differentiate from that. It's, we wanted to make sure that it's not people don't think it's just a hockey movie. Uh, it really isn't. It's a, it's, it's about America. It's about race relations. Um, it's a, it's, a, there's, there's a lot of socioeconomic issues in our movie that our characters are dealing with on a daily basis. So I came up with this kind of look and aesthetic this is our second version of the hat um the problem is is that i have to order so many and then we have to ship them and then we have to store them this is not like this is my home you know like <laughs> i don't i don't have i don't have a, i don't have like somewhere that we could put boxes give away you said like, hey, wait you said you had high ceilings man you can stock them, I, you can stock them up. <laughs> I do i do I, i'll end up just sitting on the fucking boxes because you know all these like I, I had, I think I ordered the last batch I ordered, the second batch we ordered. The first one we just ordered for the, the producers. And then the second batch, I think I had an order of like 100. We got some for all the kids in the movie, all the parents, um, all the coaches. And then I just started hitting up my buddies. Like Barden bought one. And I'm like, these hats are $45. He's like, what the hell? Like, why are they so expensive? Because like, you got to pay for the, the the ones we gave away. Yeah, so yeah. Absolutely. It ended up like I ended up having, but then I ended up having to ship them all around the country to all my buddies. And I'm like, I am not doing this again. And of course the four two cannons and then whoever sees them is like, those are hats are dope. Where can I get one? And I'm like, shit, like if I only had a penny for that many, I would be rich because so many people love them. It's just not there yet. Like we want to have a merchandise page. So we do have a website. Our website is the cannons documentary.com right. on that website. We do have a spot for, 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 you know, we have a subject heading for trailer. We do not have our trailer on there yet because we want to wait until we have a home to show it. Gotcha. And that means like we want, we just don't want to have our trailer out there and then no one 
can ever like actually see the movie. We want to wait till our movie is like, it's going to be on Netflix or it's going to be on Apple. Here's our trailer. So if we do do a fall show in, in DC, we'll probably unleash our trailer on there. On that website, we have, um, we have little behind the scenes stuff. We have our character descriptions about ourselves and a little bit of like the, the process. Um, we are going to include, if I can, if we can include this episode on there, we're going to include any media. 100%, that we get. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Any yeah. media that we get, we'll, we'll throw up on there. So we also have an Instagram page, which is the Canon's. I think it's the Canon's documentary. I should have probably known that, but I, I haven't done much on the Instagram page yet because we just, we're at a standstill. We don't have a lot going on right now. It's summertime. Um, and there's no festivals. So we don't even have any festivals that we're waiting for. I think our next option is TIFF, which is in September, but unfortunately they don't really do a huge amount of documentaries. Um, so we probably won't get in there. Like that's kind of our, we're, we're resigned to that fact. So currently we're just trying to shop our movie around in literally in LA. Um, we have, we have an executive producer out there, um, that is right now has got it in front of, we actually had it in front of LeBron, uh, at clutch, um, like maybe three weeks ago or a month ago. And then KD, Kevin Durant's production company with Rich Kleiman, they are, they're now looking for content as well. Like everyone, mostly all basketball players, they're all looking for content um, because they all want to do shit. Steph Curry has his own production company. Um, and we thought they would be really good for it. Uh, KD is actually from Maryland. So he's from the area. The problem is, man, it's just hockey. Like, it's just yeah. like, they're like, you know, we don't want, you know, we don't want, you know, a, either they don't watch it. They don't get it. They don't understand it. And you're like, but dude, it's not really about hockey. Like it's, it's not like, it's not just hockey. It's about coach. It's about his legacy. Yeah. It's, it, you know, you can have any team in there, um, any sport and it's a relatable, you know, team and story. Um, but people just can't rep, get their heart around hockey as much as, you know, as us up, up here, you know, and, it's unfortunate, uh, but it's a reality. So, you know, we just need one smart, progressive human being to watch it and say, I fucking love it. Let's do this. And Steve and I are like, where do we sign? Where do we sign? What's the streaming? We don't even care. Like, let's go. Like, what? It's only going to be available on your Android. Sorry, iPhone. <laughs> I don't care. Let's go. I will be the first one to go get an Android. I'm in. Yeah, you want to get it out there, right? Especially when you've got it kind of on, not on the shelf right now, but just waiting for that date of when you can actually like get it, get it out. Cause man, you put so much work and time and, 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 and energy into it. And as well as the, you know, as well as the, all the porcupine players and coach and stuff like that. So yeah, you definitely want to want to get the story out there for sure, man. Well, we want, I mean, our, our, I, our promise was the coach was to get it done before he died. We would joke about that shit. Yeah. And now it's like becoming very real. Cause he's like, now it's five years later. Now, thank God he's healthy as an ox, but like, yo, we got to get this into a theater so that coach can go watch it because, you know, soon, you know, you know, maybe he can't see the fucking screen. I don't know. I'm not sure, but yeah. like, we got to, we got to get it out there and we put our pressure, we put that pressure on ourselves. And, you know, like I said, you know, we've got bills to pay from, from this that we've been paying for, you know, for three years that we've been carrying. So, you know, the money's not as big of an issue. It was during COVID when I wasn't working, it became a, a fairly large stress. And I think it was a huge weight on my shoulders. Um, and it let me, I let, it let me, I let it like take over my life a little bit in a negative way. Um, but I've, I've kind of come to grips with like, I don't care about the money. I never, like, I've never cared about money. Um, and all of a sudden now fucking 45, I give a shit about money. Maybe it's my, my age or maybe it's where I'm, where I am in my life, but I'm back to being like, fuck, like I didn't do this for the money. I did this for the experience. I did this to tell an, an, an incredible story about an incredible human being. And, you know, the money, if, again, you follow your heart and the money should follow, you know, like they always say it will follow. And I'm like, well, right now it's not, I, I don't see it. So <laughs> Um, but you know, I've always believed that I've, I've done, I've really done whatever I can and, and be passionate about what I'm doing. And I was passionate about this from the day one, somewhere in the last year, I lost that passion, but it's, it's definitely, it's definitely come back and, you know, and, and I feel, I feel I'm very proud of what we've done. We've done an amazing, like people really enjoy our movie and that's all we cared about. Yeah, and cool. people want to know more about coach Neil and want to know more about Fort DuPont Cannons because we've showed it to people that we know and trust, like my, you know, well, my parents haven't seen it. Uh, sorry, mom and dad. Um, but you know, people, people that I, I know and trust that aren't my parents, 
and they just love it. You know, they fall in love with Coach Neal and his and and who he is. Um, and then the the canon, they're like, what are they doing now? Or what's this? You know, one of the mom's name is what's you know how's Carolyn doing? Or how's tomorrow doing? Like. You know, we're just like, well, we'd love to tell you, but it would ruin our fucking movie. So, like, just give us some time and hopefully hopefully you can watch it from, you know, the comfort of your couch or something or, you know, on your phone while you're while you're on a plane. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's been it's been great. And it's I think I think once we get it out there, like I've always felt and, and this is from the beginning, I always felt it was a film festival movie. I always felt that we had to have butts in the butts in the theater watching it together and then people would walk out and go have a beer or a, you know a coffee and be like how amazing is coach neil and what like why is there not more people like him in this world but you don't get that from streaming separately and all this other shit so we always wanted to be have our premiere in the theater and we always wanted to have like a shared community experience with the with the canons and with and with um you know and with friends and family and we thought that and we still think that if this actually gets out there, people will just be drawn to him and his magnetic personality and, and to our story. It's just that, you know, sometimes when you send, you know, someone a movie to, to, to proof and they watch it on their laptop and they might be in a shitty mood, they might be in, in an indifferent mood, um, or it might not be the right setting, you know, like no one should watch anything on their phone, but people do. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes things get lost and sometimes the, you know, feelings and, and emotions, uh, just don't translate through that medium. You know, you throw yourself in a theater, you turn your phones off and you're in a two hour experience where you aren't distracted and you're in their world. And that's what we wanted to do is we wanted to take you into coach Neil Roberts and Rayvon's world and, 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 and no distractions. And, and I think if, if that ever gets done, I'll be, I'll be incredibly happy and humbled and, and honored. Oh, it's cool, man. I think, yeah, it's great. And you're right. It's just like getting that one or two people to, that can help push this kind of over that hump and get it and get it moving, you know? And the other thing that you said that I think is really important for anybody getting into what they're passionate about is not chasing the money as much as we all need money to live. Don't get me wrong. We need the hydro turned on. We need to be able to eat and stuff. But uh, you know, that's something that I've really tried to like believe in and really try to pursue in my, in my careers. Don't make decisions because of a paycheck, make decisions because it's the right thing you're doing and you want to do it. And, and you're, you know, obviously doing it for the right reasons. Cause I think that's super valuable. And, at the end of the day, you know, things will work out. And I honestly, like even what you're doing right now, like, uh, you know, and I really appreciate you coming on and chatting and, and talking about this because you're obviously super passionate about it. And I think COVID sucked the life out of a lot of people. You know, I've gone through my ups and downs through COVID and been really rattled about the rinks not being open, not being able to work and all this stuff. And I think there has been a lot of positives through COVID, you know, and I know everyone's had different experiences with it, but it's nice to see you passionate about this. And obviously this is a, you know, a huge part of your life over the last little while. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful that, you know, for to have you on here and help, you know, kind of share and spread the word on what you're doing for sure. Yeah. I appreciate that, man. I, uh, like I said, I think our, our worlds were kind of like, it, this was obviously going to happen at some point and yeah. when I emailed you and didn't hear back from you, uh, I wasn't worried about it. And then when fish had mentioned your name and I was like, that comes from something in the recent, in the recent past. And, and, and you know, with the connection with Bowen too, that just seems to be like too perfect. Uh, you know, and then that's it. It's like, you know, um, one thing I did want to mention if, if, uh, if I could, is that we will be, we actually are doing the same thing. That's why I was, I was actually even more intrigued about doing the podcast because I want to see how this, how your podcast, I'm going to judge you and, yeah, and, and grade you on how this turns out because <laughs> we're doing our own podcast for the show or for our movie basically. And it's like a behind the scenes, the making of the canons, because we feel like we, are not being creative. We're not doing anything right now. We, there's nothing we can do um, except for maybe make more hats, but that would just cost us too much more money. Um, so we're going to do a podcast where, you know, Steve and I talk about, you know, kind of like chronological order and we had actually filmed or, or recorded episode one last week um, of the making of, and, you know, kind of go through the season without, without trying to touch upon any of the, the narrative storylines, um, and then at the end of the episode, so we we figured that we we're going to probably try and have a 30, 30 to 35 minute us rambling. But as you probably witnessed, it's hard for me to shut up. So that might be hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then and then a 15 minute guest from the movie, um, cool. you know, like what they're doing. So, you know, uh, you know uh, what they're doing now kind of thing. But the, what they're doing now is irrelevant because no one <laughs> knows who they are then. So we haven't figured out that format yet, but we're still kind of like writing it out. Um, and, 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 and trying to figure out like, 
you know, do we want to get onto Apple and Spotify? Like all this shit that, you know, I love, I love podcasts. I love this stuff, but uh, I'm like, again, I'm just like, Steve, dude, can you do the logistics of this shit? And I'll just, yeah. I'll bring my, I'll bring my sweaty t-shirt. Like I'm in. <laughs> yeah. That's the hardest thing when you get into something like this is the behind the scenes, not knowing how to get it out there. Where do you put it? What do you do with it? But I think it's an excellent idea. Uh, to do that and even just give more like insight on what you did and how you did it, how you created it. And I think even other filmmakers or photographers would probably love to listen to how you guys went through the process of, like you said, like we really looking back on it now, you probably learned so much of that process of so much, movie, dude. right? So so much. Sharing that with people, I think is, is the best thing. Like even for us, like I do a lot of skills and, and things like that as skill videos for hockey and, and all the skill, 80% of the skill videos that I do are free online. They're all on YouTube. I have them out there. You can go check them out. Like, but I want to share stuff with people. I want people to come and check out our stuff. These podcasts, like this is going to go out the way it is now. I'll edit it. I'll put a front on it or an end on it. I'll put uh, your name and stuff on a couple, every 10 minutes, I'll put that in. So people know who you are, what you're doing about the movie. And it's just this, I, I you know, and unless you say something or you text me in a bit, you're like, Oh, actually leave that out. When I, when I called my mom, this, which she didn't do, but then I'll say, okay, I'll edit that out. But I normally don't edit. I was just like, shit, did I say something about my mom? <laughs> no, I leave it, man. I just like, this is what it is. This is who we are. We're having fun. We're, you know, we're going to yeah, just throw it around a little bit. And I think that's yeah. one thing that the feedback I've received. Well, it's, people, our, it's our world of content, right? Dude. Like totally. People just want, like, we're just like, it's, it's your brand association. Like, you know, that's all we thought. We're just like, you know, if we had a podcast, like, and make it evergreen so that it doesn't, it's not time sensitive and people can listen to it. Once the movie comes out, they can go back and listen to it, totally. even if it's been out for a year. Yeah, right. Exactly. And what, what, what would the name of the podcast be then? Would it be the, like the cannons or behind the scenes or. I think it's, I think it's the making of the cannons. Like cool. we haven't actually, cause I know, I know with Apple, we have to do some artwork. We have to do, you know, some sort of, like, yeah. I think we have to do a brief info or intro and stuff like that. We haven't done that part yet. Cause like I said, my partner, I was helping him move earlier. He's moving to Fredericton um, tomorrow. Um, but we haven't done the logistics because we've heard that it takes two to three weeks to set up all this other shit. Yeah. Cause I got a bunch of buddies that all do sports net podcast so we've got to do those little things but i think it's just gonna be the making of the canons that seems like the most logical you know brand association yeah. that we can do um but in the end my partner has the my partner is more opinionated than i am i'm like let's do this and then he's like no let's do it this way and i'm like okay like i just don't give a shit i'm like i will think up i will think up a stupid idea he will then manipulate it and make it into something a little bit more like linear or um you know like he'll pinpoint something that i said in there make it into it and then he and then it's just like do we need to argue about this or can we just do it and I'm, and i'd be like let's just do it i don't give a yeah. shit like I, I don't care if it's my idea or our idea but let's just do this like let's stop stop with the emails back and forth like i don't care what fucking font it is let's just do this yeah totally i like, like it. this yeah. this font took like three years to get him to okay it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, dude, it's font. He's like, it's font is everything, man. And I'm like, okay, whatever. Just if, just you choose that. Yeah. I don't know. It's like, if we're a bad married couple. It's fucking well, tell like, them, like, Are those drapes okay? I'd be like, I'd be fine with no drapes. Well, we need drapes. Yeah. Like, okay, fucking you choose that. <laughs> <Don't>, like, <laughs> I mean, like, like I even nowadays, you said like everyone's taking in content, observing content. I mean, look at, look at platforms like TikTok. Like those videos are made on iPhones. They have filters on them. It's, a, it's like, all over the place from decent videos to like crap videos and people are getting millions of hits. Kids are making money on these things. Like it's crazy. Right. I don't think to your point, I'm kind of more leaning on your side of this where I'm like, I don't think, I don't think I care what the font looks like. I think it's cool. It's cool. The pops. I mean, very right first of I'm in, we, I don't care. <laughs> we just shot a music video. We have a music video for our documentary. I don't know if any documentaries have music video. We just shot a music video on Saturday for our documentary. We're going to have a music video. I'm, I'm like, do we really need a music video? He's like, why not? And I'm like, fucking more content. Let's yeah, do it. Yeah, totally. So, and he actually, he shot the whole thing. We shot the whole thing by we, he did. I was busy golfing. Um, he shot the whole thing on his phone. And yeah. he's like, it is, it is fantastic. Everything looks awesome. He's like, I can't oh. wait to share with you. And I'm like, awesome, dude. I'm like, we're the only documentary of all time to have a music video. I'm like, perfect. Love it, man. I'm like, Love it. I'm like our movie may not get online, but our fucking, our, our video will get on much music. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh, well, listen, buddy, man, this has been awesome, man. I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, we'll, we'll, in, and honestly, I'll, if you if you guys get close to coming, you know, getting this thing going, or you know, a date, let me know and I'll share it, or I'll have you back on, or even you and your partner will have back on. And I want to touch basically to you about coach, and see if uh, see if you can make a connection because he'd be an awesome guest, a guy who obviously played some pro hockey and uh, you know obviously played in some tough tough times. 
did you train? Did you work in DC as well? Yeah. So I was at the Capitals for five years. Okay. When, yeah. What years? Up until like, up until COVID. So up until 2019, 20. Like working in DC or yeah. were you doing remotely or just traveling? Yeah. So back I was, I would fly into DC for the last two years. Like I worked for the organization for five years, mostly in Hershey and with prospects. Hershey's where their HL team is. Okay. And then the last two years I was in Hershey and I was in uh, Washington. I'd fly in there and work with the big club for. So did, did yeah. you get a ring? Uh, no, I did not, but I was, I was part of the staff and all that stuff with, uh, yeah. the, uh, yeah. Yeah, cap. So yeah, I was, around. Because that was pretty cool. So the first place that the capitals took the Stanley cup was to the Fort Dupont arena. Um, <laughs> yeah. So when you're saying all this, a lot of the stuff is ringing with me now, like even when yeah. we started talking, because I know that they're tied in, uh, with yeah. the hockey community and stuff like that, which is awesome. So yeah. Yeah. Like, like Ovechkin and Leonsis took the, took the cup That's to right. the Fort Dupont yeah. arena and it was only for the Fort DuPont cannons. Like, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's other programs that play and practice out of there. They were not invited. It was just the Fort DuPont cannons right. that were invited. And I forget, I don't think coach picked it up, but I should, I, I may forget that it's in our movie. So I should know that, cool. um, but it's, but they've been very, they've been wonderful. Coach loves Leonsis. He loves OV. OV has been great to them um, and, and really supportive in, in many ways. So um, that's why we're obviously hoping you know, and, and then that's why I was like, I was like, of course, I'm like, this, this would be great if, uh, you know, you knowing DC, maybe knowing a bit about the area, yeah. um, you would have known a little bit like, man, I loved my time. I was down there off and on for like a year and a half. The One of the best food cities I've ever been to, like, because it's so multicultural, because of the, of the government, like some incredible, incredible restaurants and, uh, and some good bars too, but like yeah. just great craft beer there too. Exactly. Like, it's just a good food city. I enjoyed it. It was, it was like where North meets South. Like it was just like, everyone was warm. The weather was beautiful. Um, I, lo I loved it. I thought it was great. So, you know, maybe, maybe you can come to DC, <laughs> come to DC and be yeah. the premiere. Um, it's tough but, you know, I am, I am planning on having a premiere in London. Uh, cool. my buddy, my buddy, my buddy owns the seeps and Barney's, uh, and I've asked him if we could put up a screen you know, depending on when the, what the weather's like and, and what it is, it would be great to, you know, I will have one from all my friends and family in London uh, awesome. that we can, that we can watch it with, but you know, we want to do it in DC first and then kind of save it and then see where it is. But, you know, at some point it'll be definitely probably on the side of Archie's or whatever that becomes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah totally. That'd be cool. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Okay. That's great, man. All right, buddy. Well, man, thank you very much. Best of luck with everything. And if there's anything I can do to help out or help push this a little bit or send it out, uh, let me know. Cause I think this is a really, really, uh, really cool, really cool idea. Thank you. Awesome, thank man. you for your time, man. And thank you for your interest. And, uh, you know, uh, please say hi to Bowen for me. I will for sure. All right, All right dude. To kind of raise that bar. Uh, that extra gear, that first three steps. Huge strides in the performance that I might not be the player I am today. 